you very much. I am uh, looking for my ah. Sorry. Can you see my my PowerPoint? No. Ah, here we are. Is that better? Okay, okay. Kamsamida. Thank you so much. Sorry, can you see the PowerPoint? Yes. Okay, it's excellent. Okay. If you want to make it a little larger, otherwise it's okay, I think. Whoops. Oh, okay, I think it's okay. It's okay, I think. Everybody, I think I can just read the point. Okay. Um, okay, thank you very much. I am uh, delighted to be here with you and uh, I'm grateful for the uh, organizers and for Afomedi and the IMS uh, in Busan as well. I am a diplomatic interpreter and I am interested in interpreting studies and uh, I maintain that uh, interpreting studies um, is obviously it's a sub branch of translation studies but when it comes to uh, diplomatic interpreting we see that diplomatic interpreting is overshadowed by conference interpreting uh, that is more in the western europe and in uh, countries like canada australia and the united states and other countries with large uh, communities migrant communities we have community interpreting Community interpreting and conference interpreting, particularly in the Mediterranean, um, overshadow uh, diplomatic interpreting. There are so many reasons why this happens. One of them is because uh, diplomatic interpreting obviously takes place behind closed doors. It is not open to researchers and it is not, it doesn't lend itself to academic research. Of course, there is a lot of uh, effort by academics. We do have literature, but if again, if we look uh, at the literature, it is either diplomatic interpreters have written their memoirs or academics have gone out and they are um, investigating the phenomenon of diplomatic interpreting secondhand, meaning that they interview uh, diplomatic interpreters or they interview diplomats um, and they rather comment on diplomatic interpreting. So the research question is that diplomatic interpreting needs to be investigated further. That's the background to this uh, presentation. But the presentation itself is um, about uh, the uh, uh, bicentenary of the Rosetta Stone, the decipherment of the Rosetta Stone. Um, Oops. Um, the Rosetta Stone is basically from Alexandria. Um, it is from the year, the end of the second century BC, from 196 BC. Uh, Egypt became part of the Hellenistic world when Alexander the Great uh, invaded Egypt in 332 to establish um, a dynasty uh, that later became known as the Ptolemaic dynasty after his death and burial <clears throat> in Egypt in uh, 323. For almost 300 years, 
Alexandria became known as the queen city of the Mediterranean and the city was uh, Greek. It was, uh, it became obviously Hellenistic, the center of Hellenism in the Eastern Mediterranean. I am interested in examining the interaction between Egyptians and the Ptolemies, the Greek inhabitants of the city of Alexandria, and also when Alexandria became uh, an international city uh, open to everybody. Trade was uh, the key word uh, in the eastern part of the Mediterranean uh, for, th for the last 300 years before our era. But it is also interesting to bear in mind that Alexandria remained or continued to be, uh, uh, to, to play its role as a major city for almost a thousand years until the seventh century AD. Now, there are problems in the research because um, the relationship between the Egyptians and the Greeks were not always good. And uh, around 200 BC, uh, Egypt uh, experienced some revolts uh, and the taxes were too heavy and the control of the Ptolemaic of the, of the country was, uh, I mean, we have to remember that Alexandria was just outside the Nile Valley and we had, as the Romans called it, uh, Alexandria ad Egyptum, Alexandria next to Egypt. But we must remember that Greeks, correction, Greek, the language was actually spoken in Egypt uh, for almost 400 years prior to the arrival of Alexander the Great. The reason Alexander went to Egypt because Egypt was already known to the Greek world because there were uh, soldiers, paid soldiers, mercenaries working for the, um, the Egyptian pharaohs towards the end of pharaonic uh, period. Um, to cut a long story short, uh, there is the next slide is very important and it, uh, we have seen this uh, picture last week and it sums up diplomatic tensions and uh, crises, the lack of uh, trust, the lack of uh, confidence and the absence of interpreters in, in the room. One of the problems of diplomatic interpreting is that uh, we see uh, that the selection of interpreters is ad hoc. Uh, it's not based on linguistic merit. It is based on other things. Mostly or usually it is security uh, reasons or people who speak languages. The assumption is that uh, if you studied uh, in English, uh, then you must speak English well and you can interpret uh, from and into English. Uh, interpreting, interpreting is a very old practice and uh, we have seen this uh, mentioned in, in uh, uh, holy books, the reference to the Tower of Babylon in the Quran. There's a reference to God created people with different uh, languages, different tongues, so that they get to know each other. In ancient Egyptian um, literature, there is a hymn to the uh, Aten, that is Akhenaten, in the 14th century, when he praises the uh, one God, and he says, you created uh, men with different tongues and different skins, um, different color skin. So the idea of uh, interpreting uh, is uh, as old as mankind or humankind. Uh, it is interesting that uh, in translation studies, we use the term uh, the, uh, or the expression, uh, the Tower of Babel, uh, as the beginning of translation. Uh, actually, this is the beginning of interpreting because in those days, a long, long time ago, uh, the world was illiterate. Uh, even when interpreters, correction, even when messengers and ambassadors were sent, they were not sent with uh, the written document. Of course, sometimes they were, but 
mostly they were sent with a verbal message. Uh, hence, I am just the messenger. I am carrying the, the diplomatic message. Um, the research that I'm uh, working on is that uh, the city of Alexandria as a multilingual, uh, multicultural city, uh, there was diplomatic interpreting, not just between Egyptians and the Greek ruling family, but also between the inhabitants of the city of Alexandria with its museum, library, businesses, consulates, uh, and trade um, with the outside world, particularly the Eastern Mediterranean. And then we have the Rosetta Stone. And the Rosetta Stone, as I mentioned, um, became very important because it held the key to the culture, language, and literature of ancient Egypt. And then uh, I look at diplomatic interpreting in the age of machine translation, followed by concluding remarks. The ancient city of Alexandria, uh, as I already mentioned that it, uh, during its life as the ancient city uh, was for a thousand years and translation is very important, interpreting is very important. In the library, in the ancient library of Alexandria, we have the practice of copying and translating books from everywhere. Uh, as soon as there is knowledge of a copy or even a version of a work, it would be brought to Alexandria, copied, deposited in the library, and translated. Uh, between 332 BC, that's the advent of Alexander and the establishment of the Ptolemaic dynasty, towards the end, which is with the uh, death of Cle the, the defeat of Cleopatra and Mark Antony uh, at the Battle of Actium off the coast of southern Greece or Western Greece rather, uh, and the Roman occupation in the year 30. And even for the next seven centuries, it is important to keep an eye on the ancient language of Egypt. Uh, the, uh, we, we call it ancient Egyptian. The system of writing was uh, the hieroglyphs. And of course, the hieroglyphic writing um, was lost. It was lost when the, when the Egyptians changed their, their language and they started to write their language uh, in Greek letters. That took place in the middle of the third century, around 250 uh, AD. At that time, Egypt was a Roman province. And during that time, Egypt was uh, a special province in the Roman Empire. Uh, not open to anyone from Rome, except uh, the equestrian class, uh, a very high class with a direct uh, permission from uh, Caesar himself. The important thing is that the secrets to the ancient Egyptian script was lost. And indeed, archeologists today know that the last inscription in hieroglyphs was uh, in the year 394 AD uh, on the walls of the temple of uh, Philae in southern Egypt. The Egyptians uh, adopted Christianity. They wanted to, to translate the Bible from Greek into uh, Egyptian in a language that is available to everyone. Uh, it, it has to be accessible. So they translated the, the Greek Bible into Egyptian, but they, at the same time, they changed their script uh, to a more alphabetic, uh, accessible, easy to learn uh, uh, script, which is uh, the Coptic script. The letters were based on the uh, Greek alphabet, but they added uh, seven different or seven new sound uh, letters because they were peculiar to the Egyptian phonetic system.
And then we come to the year 196. Briefly again, and uh, I will rely on you to tell me about uh, the time. Um, we have uh, the king, the Greek king Ptolemy V. At that time, not around 196, the taxes were very high, the economic system was uh, very tight, uh, the conditions were not good, so, so the Egyptians revolted ag against the system, the government, uh, in more than one part of Egypt. Uh, the king decided to ease the taxes and to forgave the, the temples, and the temple played a very important role. That was the administrative system of Egypt, temple, towns, provinces. The ancient Egyptians welcomed the, the idea of having uh, Greek influence in the country, but they didn't like the idea of big metropolis or big cities. They were very closely following the ancient Egyptian system of temple town uh, system. The king realized that the priests control the country, and con if you wish to control the economy, you must control the, uh, the political system. It was a religious system. So they uh, made a deal with the priests and they forgave the people the, ta they, the, the debts, they canceled the uh, taxes, they eased the restrictions, and the, the priests were happy. And to thank the, the king, they decided to make a big stela. A stela is a big slab of stone. Let us say it's about a meter and a half by half a meter. Uh, I mean, one meter and a half in length by uh, almost half a meter. And uh, they decided to write the decision or the decree of the king. Thank you very much for easing the taxes and for giving uh, us our debts for making a presence to the temples and we are very grateful for this and we will record this on a slab of stone to be placed in every major temple which is fine but the historical event uh, is such that they decided to write this resolution or decree in two languages, Greek and ancient Egyptian. The ancient Egyptians used to write in two different systems, the hieroglyphic system for religious temples and monumental writings, and the language of the people, demotic, from demos, the people, uh, the popular language, the popular script. So we have the top uh, text, 14 lines of hieroglyphs, followed by 32 lines of the demotic language, and the bottom is Greek, ancient Greek. The Rosetta Stone itself is unimportant, as from the archaeological point of view, it is very insignificant um, uh, historically. It just says the priests say thank you to the king and they will uh, write this on a piece of stone. But its importance, um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm mixing. Uh, archaeologically, it is unimportant, but its significance lies in the fact that it is a translation. It is a translation document uh, from uh, archaeological point of view and the museum piece. It is not really a beautiful piece at all. Uh, it is rather its value as an archaeological piece because it holds the key to uh, ancient languages. Um, the Rosetta Stone is not unique because according to the last line in the, in the text, the priest said, we will make a slab of stone like this in every major temple. So it means that archeologists probably will find another Rosetta Stone. There were 42 provinces in Egypt. If they erected one slab in each temple, there should be another 42, 41 uh, pieces like this one. It is not rare because it is not the only one that, ha that had a bilingual text. So this is a background to the um, Rosetta Stone itself. 
Uh, the decipherment is another issue that I am interested in because uh, how it was deciphered, of course it is, uh, I mean, my background is also in Egyptology and I take great interest in the ancient language of Egypt. The decipherment was uh, a totally different story that needs to be told. It will be told this year because it's the bicentenary of the decipherment. But in a nutshell, uh, it shows how a mathematician tried, uh, he is uh, an Englishman, and the other person, a Frenchman, a, a, a linguist. So we have Thomas Young, the, the, the English, and Jean-Francois Champollion, the French. And uh, today we have machine translation. And of course, machine translation relies on computational linguistics and linguistics, applied and descriptive linguistics. And it, we need to highlight and underscore the importance of cooperation. Of course, we talk about uh, uh, multidisciplinary research, cooperation, and interdisciplinary research, but perhaps the decipherment of the Rosetta Stone shows the importance of this. Uh, of course, there are so many lessons that we could learn from the decipherment of the Rosetta Stone. The academic rivalry shouldn't really be uh, uh, as important as it was 200 years ago. Uh, the combination between mathematical knowledge and linguistic knowledge as we see in machine translation. But from an academic point of view, uh, diplomatic interpreting is a discipline that deserves more research. It deserves to be treated as a discipline in its own right, uh, sui generis. The reason for that is the first slide that I showed you uh, as the crisis in, the, uh, in Ukraine uh, shows, and uh, there was an interesting article about diplomatic interpreting in The Economist a couple of days ago. Um, translation studies continues to ignore uh, diplomatic interpreting, although time and time again, we see the importance of diplomatic interpreting. And even when we have diplomatic interpreters, we really need to treat them uh, professionally. We need to put them in the picture. The media does not like to show interpreters in the picture when two heads of states meet. They always crop them out uh, or they choose an angle where the interpreter is not in the picture. It's exactly like when we look at uh, a foreign president and we hear the voice of the translation. Um, this is this is what we read, voice of the translator. The translator is a human being, is a professional. You should actually put his name or her name, and it's not the translator, it's actually the interpreter. These things reflect how the media, the community, and academia, and the professions, the Department of Foreign Affairs, for example, think and view uh, diplomatic interpreting. Um, I hope that I am within the time and thank you very much for listening.